there was a lot of frustrations like staff. I mean, I'm, I'm 18, 19 years old managing people that have been at this company since it started. You know, they're like in their 50s. You know, they've been there for a long time and they're not really thrilled that I'm in charge. Hey, pronouncers, welcome back. Got a fun episode. Um, but uh, wanted to let you know, you know this, Print Hustlers is back this year. Very excited. Go to printhustlers.com and what you're going to see is our 2023 event. It's in Newport Beach area. Um, really exciting though because it's November 4th, 5th, and 6th. So you've got the Printavo Inksoft User Summit going over a bunch of cool things there. That's at Liquid Graphics. If you've never seen this shop, prepare to be absolutely jaw-dropped amazed. <laughs> November 5th, which has got all of our talks and speakers, and you're going to learn a lot there. And then the 6th, Bell and Canvas Factory Tour. This place is unbelievable as well. So grab your tickets, printhouses.com. Um, fun episode. We've got Hunter Strine from Maryland Print House coming up. Uh, his growth to $6 million in sales, moving to a 10,000 square foot facility. And then we also talk about owner's pay. Um, I was yeah, thinking about it in my head, tangent. and I just was just like – are you profitable? And uh, we kind of went into how each of us are thinking about reinvesting versus pulling money out of the business. Um, kind of a taboo topic, but I think it's important to think about it sooner than later. It's interesting. Uh, me and Hunter are on the younger side of a high growth printing kind of side and how we think about things. I was like, it was interesting to just like see like, okay, how are you thinking about this? How long can you go paying yourself that way? until you right. actually want to make more. Um, probably some some battle scars there. Uh, but Bruce, we've got some sponsors. Yeah. We've got some look, awesome sponsors. They're awesome. Easy way. Um, Stephen's spending a lot of time cleaning dirty screens lately, I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to help you out. Easy Way's line of environmentally conscious chemicals will help you get the job done faster more efficiently and cost you the fraction of the cost per screen. Campusing has a lot of favorite easy way chemicals, number two being 701 and 848 to help with reclaim. But if you need a company that's got great how-tos, best practices, and just an awesome support team, right? They work with 100 plus distributors. They are there to help you and make you guys a lot more efficient. You always need a strong partner when growing your business. Bruce, I know that you have a heat press in your house and you order from Supercolor. Uh, and Supercolor is the world's best heat transfer. It's made for screen printers, by screen printers. They understand the pressures and expectations of running a screen printing business. And that's why they pride themselves on being super fast and super easy. Whether you're printing t-shirts, caps, or bags, Supercolor's unique transfers are designed for specific materials, decorate technical fabrics, expensive items with a super simple solution. Um, as cold season's coming along and you want to decorate a North Face, you can use Supercolor. So experiment, uh, sorry, experience them for yourself using promo code PRINTAVO15. Get 15% off your first order Thanks so much, Supercolor. We appreciate you. Have you heard of Multicraft Daddy? And do you know how many followers Multicraft Daddy has? Take a guess. Wait, wait. Don't look. Take a guess. Ooh, 902. Are you serious? Did you look? No. Oh, my God. You're, dude, you're dead on. It's 902. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Holy well, cow. With 902 that... followers. <clears throat> Multicraft is your supplier for ink supplies or a daddy. Multicraft screen printing and digital supplies for over 50 years have been providing you with top brands at competitive pricing. And as usual, you mentioned Printable Pod, and that should get you 10% off your first order. Also, hint, hint, send him a DM, and he's sending out PMI tape every single week to people who want to try it, or I guess if you're just running low. <laughs> Bruce, did you see uh, Multicraft Daddy's recent Instagram video he made with the Rolls Royce commercial? Yeah, he's he's making some good stuff. It's pretty funny. It was incredible. It was cringeworthy and incredible, and everything we <laughs> want out of him. So thank you, Multicraft underscore Daddy. We love you, Bruce. You suck at art. Let's just let's you're okay at it. Um, but <laughs> I used to have my shortcuts down, but yeah, no, I'm very yeah. rusty. And that's why it's important that you have a solution to improve efficiency in your shop 
um, in your art department. So if you go to 1900hotstuff.com, you're going to find Graphic Source. They offer industry leading outsource options for your shop by truly becoming a part of your team. They plug and play with Printavo and other shop management software. So when it comes to SEPs, mockups, creative art, order management, embroidery, digitizing, back office admin, customer service, there's no better company in our industry to work with. They have over 30 years in the game and a proven track record of success. Hit them up at graphicsource.com for your art staffing needs. Mention the Printavo pod and you'll get 50% off your first vector, SEP, or embroidery order. We have three full-time dedicated um, Graphex members that work both in the art and our back office. And uh, we just sent them some hoodies to Honduras, and they sent us a group pick, which was pretty cool. So Sick. we got uh, – it's pretty awesome. So thanks so much, GraphX. We appreciate you. Bruce, let's get to the show. No, we are live. Hunter, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, of course. Happy you, to be here. Uh, you have a pretty busy week. You know, it's, it's screen printing, so I feel like uh, it never ends. <laughs> Hunter, we're on a DTF journey together. Dude, let me tell you. It's not – it's been quite the journey, I must say. <laughs> It's uh, fine and fine and it's it's been a journey, I should say. Well, where's the common? Are you guys buying the same stuff, or are you, you like I'll try this one, you try this one, we'll meet back in the middle? I don't know. Where do you start, we, I, I, dude? I don't know. It's just like it's it's got to get resolved. I, I I mean, it's like today we're dealing with stuff like just the machines, man. It's just there's got to be it's got to be something out there that's better, you know, like it's, I just feel like every machine is the same thing, but rebranded. And like, we've done the research, but I, I mean, I know Steven's talked to me about one that he's pretty happy with as of lately, but it just feels like, you know, you get six, eight months in and then things change. And it's just, it's just different than I feel like a lot of, you know, the other machines that we may own. Like we don't have that same issue. <laughs> um, like they work every day and stuff. And yeah. Like they work every day, you know, you get, you get your usage out of it. You know, it's like a car. Hunter, what percentage of your business now of, of Maryland print house? And I know you've got kind of a startup also you're working on is DTF now. Yeah. So, um, I would say, I, I don't know exactly, but I would say probably like 25, 30%, if not, maybe more. Um, we're doing a lot of DTF. Wow. I mean, it's been a, it's been a great solution for, um, we're, we're very online store heavy as far as like corporate wear, you know, um, employee points, that kind of thing. So like uh, a lot of HR, you know, corporate, corporate, uh, companies, but, um, you know, it's really, really expedited our, our delivery times for that. And to be frank, like it just gives us the flexibility to, to like decorate on different, types of garments. And, um, I think that's the biggest value prop for us was that like, a like, how can we do this a lot faster, but also like decorate on more items? Because, you know, one of the things that got us into it to begin with was, um, you know, we're obviously building, uh, the startup shirt desk, but, um, one of the things we realized through COVID was that there was a big need for, um, print on demand, but, but, a lot of customers weren't satisfied with the product selection that they were getting from some of the largest print on demand companies, you know, in the world. And that's, I think mostly due to the fact that a lot of it is automated through DTG, which is, which is good um, for, for certain things, but for other items, it's just not feasible. It can't be decorated on. So, I mean, obviously like with the, with the right machines, they, they've, they've come a long way on, on direct garment since, you know, I first learned about it, but um, you know, it, it, there are certain items that they still can't, per, you know, make perfect and, and they're struggling with. So like, you know, tie dyes is a good example where there's a lot of bleed and people were unhappy with it. And so, you know, just from like simple things like that, we, we had a lot of inquiries and, um, you know, price points, a big one, but, um, you're definitely able to get a pretty, pretty solid price point on DTF. I feel like compared to direct carbon, at least the machines we were running, um, you know, I mean, we're, we've cut that cost by like. 60 percent 80 percent i think from start to finish so like that's a big one as well for sure and you also order transfers all the time too right like you've got yeah, cool yeah, things yeah. you're working on how long did you go for until you bought your machine like was it a how much revenue how much were you spending well we bought we had dtg and dtf at the same time just to kind of bridge the gap um initially when we bought direct to film it was bought specifically for testing purposes for a uh, shirt desk knowing that we would use it you know the volume for our online stores eventually um so i would say like really it was zero there was no like 
it wasn't revenue driven uh, to start. Um, but I think, you know, it would make sense to get into this. I, our revenue for online stores um, we'll probably co- cross like 600,000 this year. So, I mean, it's definitely helpful to like, and that's just, you know, our Maryland print house stores. Um, we also are able to use it for spec samples, which is huge for like our influencers. So we have a separate business called creators label, which isn't talked about much. Um, we're working on a, a big relaunch at the end of this year, hopefully. Um, but it, one thing that we always struggled with was like, how can we get spec samples to our customer? to just like wear in the video before we actually do a print print run, because we always struggled with capacity and screen printing, just like to be able to do like a, a single piece um, that might be a lot of colors was hard. So like it really helped with that, especially for items we couldn't DTG, um, you know, instead of having to like order one transfer or whatever, um, it's, it helped a lot with that too. You said like 20, 30% of the shops now uh, direct to film. What like, just to understand your guys' size, because I saw you also moved into a 10,000 square foot facility. Like, is there a number of people or, or revenue to, to understand what percentage? So we just there? we just hit 20 full time employees. So we, we have 20 full time. Um, and uh, I would say, like, we just bought this space. We're actually still in the process of moving in. But um, I would say, like. Uh, where our goal for for top line like revenue between all of our companies is going to be like five six million this year um but we've just grown really fast i mean the company's uh five years old so it's encroaching on six years old but like it's it's been um you know just trying to find space in our area locally was a challenge um but yeah i mean as far as like total employees we have like three in dtf and online stores um we we had uh, we had King Screen on recently, and he was talking about like the niche that took over uh, uh, from transfers, you know, that took from screen printing in his business. Um, you talked a little bit about that, but like, what what are the types of jobs that you just kind of auto send to do on transfers to DTF? Right. Um, so I it, it's it's we don't we don't like so for our, if if we're offering contracts, so we we do contract as well, like a little bit. Um, so like we have like certain tiers that fall within that but for the most part all of our direct to film is going to be anything like six colors or more under 50 pieces um but but almost 90 percent of our dtf capacity is used by um is by our own online stores so like that's pretty much what it's used for all right real quick i gotta tell you something this is really interesting and here's why we formed a company called Inktavo. You may have heard of it, but it has three different brands right now, Printavo, Inksoft, and Graphics. So we're all sister companies now, a big happy family. What we're able to do is Printavo is managing your shop management and workflow organization. Inksoft can run your website and handle online stores at scale. So running multiple different stores for fundraisers, schools, Um, company stores and everything in between. And Graphics Flow is a brand new product to be able to help reduce all the back and forth with art. So it has a huge art library that you can put on your website so customers can see and pluck what they want. Plus, you can also be able to collect different ideas and send them to customers to approve as well. Really, really cool. Plus, in-app editing. It's like Canva, but specifically for shops. All right. Check it out. All those brands are on inktavo.com. That's inktavo.com. All right, thanks. And so so the thought process is you are taking a customer and servicing them. Like you you basically have a solution for every one of their needs. If they need to order a thousand promo products, they're there. You've got a company store for them, for their employees to do 365 fulfillment. You're still going to bulk print for them. But what I'm hearing is you are able to give this customer client or whatever like a full vertically integrated one-stop solution at maryland print house is that is that what i'm hearing yeah that's the goal um but obviously you know we still do like the bulk orders for you know whoever um but yeah i mean the goal is to take like you know a, a large company that has you know might have 300 500 employees in our area and and figure out a way to get a store built with multiple SKUs, and and this same company might have you know, six or seven companies within that company, how can we, how can we create a solution that's simple for them, simple for their HR department and easy to, to actually produce in a reasonable time frame? And I think that was like the biggest struggle we've heard from a lot of these people is that they get these stores and they have them built, 
but like they're waiting at times like two, three months for their employees to get their stuff. And so, and that's the problem. I mean, for us, it just, it seemed like an easy resolution by just, you know, working through our workflow. And to be honest, it's, it, it hasn't been easy, you know, having so many different things you're trying to accomplish, um, you know, at once while continuing to grow. I think that's probably been our hardest thing. It's like, how many different things can we be good at um, when we, you know, I, you know, have always lived by like, be really good at one thing. Um, but trying to be really good at multiple things, I would say is like definitely not an easy task and it requires a lot of resources. And I think, you know, we talked about employees, but we're definitely like super employee heavy um, because it's hard to be like super hyper efficient at like all of these different things. And so like, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's just one of those things that you have to get good at and then eventually you'll be good at multiple things and have people that are trained on each thing. Because we're, we're bringing in people that have no clue like how any of this stuff works. So, so Hunter, you went from zero to five million in six years. That's, a, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, has that been pretty linear? Did you have like a, you know, like double? And like, did you go from two and a half to five and a half? Like, what were those jumps? Yeah, I think like our first year um, was like, zero to 350. So like to, for context, I guess. Um, so I started screen printing in my parents' garage in high school, built like a surf brand, like was trying to wholesale it to like, you know, surf shops in my area, like near the beach. And uh, if you need a heat press, really with, ha- Bruce can help you heat press. Nah, dude, I was burning screens my in the sun night, and like uh, cheering. My late night text <laughs> affair. I think I figured dude, out the ghosting dude. issue. Anyway, sorry, go on. <laughs> it's not fun. It's not fun. But um, no, we were curing. We were curing with a flash, man. Like it was. It was rough. Um, but yeah. So like through college, I ended up playing soccer at Frostburg, um, which is a college, uh, you know, in our state. But uh, it, um, I slowly realized like making merch for myself and like trying to sell it to other people was not the move, and uh, so you know, ended up realizing like, let's print for other people, what have you. And in 2016, there was something called the adpocalypse. And so the adpocalypse happened on YouTube where, you know, spot, you know, the large, um, you know, um, advertisers pulled out and, and all of that. And so like, there was a huge opportunity for influencer merchandise. And uh, we built a script basically that could scrape all this data off YouTube, pull in like metrics we could filter and just send bulk emails to these YouTubers. And so we ended up just like emailing 5,000 YouTubers um, and hit on a couple. And they, all of these people had over a million subs. Like that was our focus, like volume um, because we just didn't want to deal with like print 10 shirts. And it's like a six color print, you know, like it was, it was, a. we learned that quick um, to like focus on the high volume. And so just landing like five of those took a company that I, we had started, um, you know, basically in the dorm to like, 300,000 in revenue in a month. And so we realized like, holy shit, like we need to, we need to like either make a decision if we're going to follow through with this thing or if we're going to finish college. And so um, ended up dropping out um, at the end uh, of my freshman year and, um, you know, just, just focused on continuing to build good creator merch and, and quickly learned like that summer that we couldn't print all this on a manual um, and we needed to find, you know, a supply chain to be able to do it and 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 ship it out and so we um we partnered actually with a shop actually the building we're in today um to to help us out move back you know home and uh just really just started to 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 focus on how can we take this to the next level and so creators label grew substantially over that year um to to over a million dollars in revenue and um we just you know kept going but as time went on like i was our office was actually within another screen print shop and um, just the, it was an absentee owner and things were challenging. And I just fa- found myself getting tied more and more into their business instead of focusing on mine. And um, that, that didn't um, really work out well for me because it was like, I'm, I'm your top customer today, top like two customers. And I'm, and I'm managing your shop for you as you, you're, you're, he's not here. Um, I can't, I can't focus on both, you know? And so just ended up like, you know, he even offered to like own some of it, like 50% partnership, like for sweat equity. And like, it just got to a point where after looking at the numbers and stuff, it didn't make sense. And so I decided to just like, you know what, 
we have enough business here with Creators Label. Like, why don't we just leave and and open a facility for ourselves? And if we can bring on other business, you know, while doing so, that's great. So that's why Maryland Printhouse was initially started just to support, you know, our our sister companies per se. Um, that where we were doing direct to consumer merch for influencers and and some schools. So, Wait, so that's how we buy got to this point. He his didn't shop? buy his shop, huh? Yeah, I thought that was that was no, where really yeah. this was going. Who advised you? No, yeah. So we had, ended up yeah. we ended up buying this building, which was his shop. Yeah, from the he, he bought the business from someone that built the company. She didn't sell him the building, and then we ended up buying the building. Wow, who was advising you? Like being, you know out of school whatever you know this uh, i dealt with a lot of this where i ended up buying into a shop that was printing a ton for me who where were you getting advice from yourself a professor like reddit no yeah just just like trial and error i guess you know like i just i I mean i knew enough about like books and stuff at that point to like know if a company was healthy or not you know just by looking at you know p l cash flow statements and stuff to see like how much money was being invested in and then i found out like this dude's pumping a lot of his own money i mean he's super wealthy like he you know making half a million at his day job you know like th- this was supposed to be a retirement and i think you learned quickly that screen printing is not uh, a good retirement <laughs> job and uh so i just I, I just realized how much he was putting in and like I mean, dude, I had the life insurance policy pool. Like we were ready to rock and roll. And then like, just after like looking at these books and like, just like, it just didn't make sense, you know? And um, there was a lot of frustrations, like staff. I mean, I'm, I'm 18, 19 years old, managing people that have been at this company since it started. You know, they're like in their fifties, you know, they've been there for a long time and they're not really thrilled that I'm in charge. And so it was just very difficult to navigate and it just, you know, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. And now, you know, if you look at where that company is today and, and, and it was the right decision to not, to not pursue that. And yeah, so like, that was just all just, you know, just common sense. I feel like just looking at, you know, what was going on with it. It's the interesting flip side, right? Of when people think about, Oh, I can get a leg up. If I buy something now, I can get equipment, maybe some people and stuff, but you're like, eh, not worth it. I'd rather start from scratch here. And and, yeah, uh, I, I was I was taught once like uh, you could buy the donut shop or you could build one next door and give away a thousand free donuts for the same price. It might just be easier to do it by yourself. Um, I I think what's interesting about what you're building. So you're working on a kind of a startup uh, uh, called Shirt Desk. Um, you've grown really quickly. You kind of have rolled up some companies under one. Can you tell us about Shirt Desk and what you're doing there and, 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 and how that plays into everything you're, you're doing? It's, it's, uh, the marketing is not put together. We're still, we're still working through some things. Uh, I found out quickly that like tech is hard, like very hard um, <laughs> as far as uh, especially managing it when you, you know very little uh, you know, about tech. Um, but you know, we, we, we found a, a dev team um, and the, the whole vision was how can, um, how can we build stores quickly, efficiently, and easy um, for our own company and save money and save costs uh, on labor? Because, I mean, we've got one, like, basically, if you compile everybody that works on stores, like, two to three people full-time, basically, that they're just building stores. And it's like, well, you know, does this really make sense? Um, it's, it's a very simple concept when you look at the face value of how a store is created, you know, you've got a company logo, you've got pretty simple information to, to roll up a store. So like, how can we have the customer do the work for us? And, and so, um, building shirt desk was, it's, it's a, it's basically a three-step, um, process for us, uh, as far as like how we're working on it. But the first, the first step was like, let's generate revenue for the company and get an app out on uh, Shopify to start. And like, you know, we'll roll up all the other uh, e-commerce platforms as well soon. Um, but in that way we can at least get POD started and work through our production processes for other people and just see like how that process works. And it was quite frankly, the, the, the cheapest option to begin. Um, and then, you know, moving on, it was like, you know, with phase two, can we, you know, how can we build stores quickly? Uh, and, 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 um, so, so that's what we're starting to work on now. So the app is complete. We were just in 
bug testing on certain things and just like just making sure it's functioning well for the end user but like you know phase two is what we're i think most excited about which is going to be the whole like it's going to have its own e-commerce built in um completely you know from scratch like how can we how can we how can we do that and and make it simple so it's just basically like um you know if you're going to compare it to a company like I guess Teespring back in the day where it was like a couple changeable uh, fields, but like, how can we do that based on like a couple fields um, inputted by, by the customer. And so like, you know, and now with, with AI and all these things that, that are out and, and um, we can just, you know, plug into, it does open up the, the opportunity to make something like that really easy. And so um, we'll see what, what this phase will look like over the next year, but, um, we're really excited to to get it started. And then phase three was going to be like figuring out a way to to potentially license it. If all, if, if shit hits the fan and like nothing works and we can't get direct to consumer, like we're, we're ensuring that we're building it in a way that we could license it in the future to, you know, maybe it's one person or maybe it's a couple people, maybe it's anybody. Um, but like just having that option out there, at least for certain pieces of the platform that'll really help create, um, an environment for screen printers to do POD. Um, and I think that is, is the biggest problem like with this industry is that everybody wants to be so like, um, you know, hush hush about POD. I mean, we did a lot of, we made a lot of effort to figure out how people were doing it. Um, and, and, uh, really, really coming out with, with, you know, nothing. There's a couple options out there. Um, but, but very little. And, and I think that if somebody, could at least give the tools necessary to be able to produce and, and do it. I think it would help a lot of shops that are trying to get into that space, um, but struggle to do it. And, and look, I think we can all make enough money at the end of the day uh, for everyone to be happy, especially if we can keep our direct to consumer side, you know, strong. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it hopefully will benefit everyone. Bruce, have, have you heard of, um, have you heard of me and Hunter talk about this, like order desk, Bruce, have you ever heard of an order desk? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we chat with them. And so what's interesting about order desk, a lot of the DTG on demand contract decorators use it. Um, and so if you're not using a, a, a Shopify app, a lot of times you're manually connecting your shop to order desk. Um, and there's a lot of setup involved with it. I think what's interesting is it allows for you to like connect files to an order so that it could scan the barcode, actually pull up on the DTG and print. Hunter, correct me if I'm wrong, like you're really trying to focus on that also on the DTF side of things because there isn't a good DTF on the no solution at all in the industry. And that's something we're trying to actively work on for ourselves is how do you gang transfers together? Right. And how do you take all the orders from online, make sure the shirts are here, get the transfers there and then heat press them and get them out. How like what's your production workflow work through now? Is there a lot of manual work? Have you guys built parts of the platform that you use? There's a lot of manual work still. I mean, it's it's definitely we're not we're not even close to where like our roadmap would 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 have that complete. Like I would say we're still a couple months out from not even being um ready to be tested in, in live production. But um, yeah, no, I mean, as far as like how it should work, I think is, you know, you take a piece of paper and you write out the process and like you look at it and it's like, it's pretty cut and dry. It's just, how do you, how do you bridge the gap in certain places of that process? And like, for us, it's like, that's a great question. How do you gang it? Right. Well, you just have to, you have to build a script that, that will gang it all. And, and it, it's just, it's money and time. Like, as far as like, how can we get, the end result that we want. And like, I think, you know, for us, order desk is not the end solution. It's kind of a temporary solution um, because we know that it's not going to do everything that we want it to do. Um, anything that's kind of closed off like that, I mean, is, is going to have its limitations, but uh, like, I, I, I wouldn't be the best to speak on how they're doing it, but I think, you know, I basically say, I want this, how can we do it and do it in a way that's scalable and, and like, easy to to do long term so yeah steven have, have you built something like that or are you guys trying um we're we've i mean we've got our own hack together way that we've got a bunch of tooling running in the background to get it there there's still a lot of manual work right i think the one thing that i've learned and and having a cto like neil on our team um he's like manual work is totally okay we'll automate it later 
So kind of what your point was, Hunter, is like, even if it takes a person, you know, whether it's a GraphX employee or someone from the Philippines or something, just like dragging and dropping and dragging and dropping, and that's all they do, that's totally okay. Like, don't, don't not try to do it because there's humans involved in the process. And so right now there's just like, there's a lot of human interaction um, with it. And, and I mean, that's how you learn. I mean, we spent like, that's uh, that's how they you know they they're able to learn what needs to happen and i think like we we spent probably spent a lot of money and probably two months just investigating like our process and the problem with with our like we're delayed too because we built this initially for dtg like we we were so our entire process was built on like building this for dtg not for dtf um and so like we we yeah, we had to like stop like midway through. I had to make a decision like, look, like we're switching this decoration process, which is going to change how things print, like all of this stuff. Um, and and like, yeah, I mean, but to answer that, like, yeah, you, like having the humans, like having a human do it is like super important because that's how we know, like how we can, how can we make it automated? I mean, our goal is start to finish, like orders come in for that day. It's batch. It's already loaded in the machine. Like you turn the machine on, that's always going to be the case. Somebody's managing it, watching it, making sure everything's going well. Hopefully we won't have to do that in the future. Um, but, uh, and then at the end, like auto cut, like everything barcoded, like ready to go. Like that's, that's like our end goal. It's like, you shouldn't even have to think twice. The, uh, I noticed on your website, you have these online store prices that are a little bit different than I've seen. So for example, uh, you know, you could have a store that's a hundred dollars set up. It's the better batch store package, a hundred dollars oh, set up. Best, yeah. Um, ah, it keeps rotating. It's got, um, a monthly fee, you know, there's like a $50 a month fee. Um, you get up to four designs, three design revisions. Um, and then there's a $2 handling fee and a $50 per hour design revision fee. Um, so do you follow these? Because I know, you know, a lot of times they're pitched, but maybe it's like, all right, this is a more reliable e-com uh, customer. We'll, we'll kind of waive this. Yeah. And then uh, if so, like, I mean, this seems like a good revenue driver because I think, Stephen, too, you guys charge some sort of monthly or annual or something like that. Sometimes. Depends. Yeah. I mean, we're the same way, right? Like, I mean, it's like it depends. Like, it's it's – but for our enterprise stores, yes, we do it. Like we, those setup fees start at like $5,000. And like, so what we do to incentivize them is if your total spend bulk and online store is over, say like, I think the last we did was if it's over 75,000, you'll get your money back. But like to build an entire custom WordPress solution for them to do what we need it to do is, you know, intensive. Charging a setup fee. Do you feel like that's a barrier to entry to bigger clients? I so I definitely don't want to forever. I mean, our like part part of the reason like we have to do that is because well, Shopify changed their checkout process in 2.0, and it really screwed us because they they had we had the ability to do customer points like employee points like through it, um, but when they changed, like you could no longer do that, and so it made the store we have to use WordPress or Magenta like we're using WordPress, but like it takes so much longer. And so do you feel like clients are pretty okay with paying a setup fee? Do you feel like, like, no. oh my gosh, I'm charging $3,000 or $5,000. Do you think they really care? Well, the big one, like the ones that are getting enterprise, it's a drop in the bucket for sure. But like, um, they definitely don't like it. I mean, like, yeah, we, there's definitely pushback for sure. Um, but I mean, it's the way it is. And like, I think part of it too is like, service like the level of service they're going to get here versus what they had with most of these people have stores already and we're just coming in as like a second opinion like and a lot of times i think most of the times they've ended up going with us and i think it's because like our commitment to service and like they've talked to people in their industry that use us or whatever and it's just been you know we we deliver on what we say we're going to do and a lot of companies fail at that i think i, th I think what's interesting is you've turned Maryland print house into almost like a solution agency that happens to print as well. Right. Like the fact that you're kind of selling those services offsets the risk associated to building them. And then you also get to print them. Right. So you're kind of like protecting yourself, 
Bruce, I don't know. Do you know there are other print shops that do a, a fine job at like kind of selling services? Because it's definitely people want to do it, but I have seen few do it in practice. It's an interesting balance. I think the hunter you talk about before with it is, is like where where are we focusing on, right? Because it's like if you're selling solutions to whatever they need, then w- like what are we really good at versus not? But the revenue part I just find interesting, especially on the recurring side. Maybe just you know from uh, with with Printavo and everything. But like, is that is that a is that a look to to manage the downside, kind of like the setup fee is, or do you find yourself, oh wow, this recurring revenue is really starting to add up. This is a significant part. It's of our business. I think, yeah, I think a lot. No, definitely not. Like. It's definitely not something like we get excited about, like the reoccurring. Um, but I think like it, it definitely helps offset the downside because a lot of times I think probably a lot of people, you know, in our space that do stores know this. Like you don't know what somebody's volume is going to be like when they walk in the door and want to open a store, right? Like that's that's the hardest part. And like you can build all the tools in the world, but it's super hard to determine what that's going to be. Um so that's that's what it's mainly built to do because we're committing to this price like that we're going to sell these garments for and maybe there's a fundraiser maybe there's you know x y and z like and to be frank like fifty dollars or fifteen dollars a month like isn't going to really help us save much but like it's damage limitation for the most part because there's you know if 20 percent of the stores that come in sell like shit like or like two products or whatever like it's really not it's really not worth building the store. It's really yeah, not worth putting time into doing the store. What about the yeah. enterprise stores? Like if they don't blink an eye at paying, I don't know, 5K or 10K, I can't remember what you said for a setup fee, do they also not care about paying, you know, I mean, because the Shopify Plus, for example, if they're, what does that start at 2,000 or something a month? So, can you know, could you oh, charge, Plus. like is, yeah. is there something there for those enterprise customers of also paying a significant amount Monthly. I mean, I look at like, uh, I don't know how this works specifically, but I, I purchased some uh, Oklahoma State University gear uh, maybe a couple months ago, and I saw it was a Fanatics store. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, so Fanatics must, Thanks, you know, Bruce. they're running the back end of this. Yeah. Thanks, jackass. <laughs> oh, <oops. laughs> but they must have, they must have a deal with them, obviously, to lock into this. But then also, they must be charging them not just for the merch, but I'm sure they're charging, you know, platform fees and monthly fees and annual contract and servicing and whatever else. It's different in the licensing space. It's actually almost the opposite is that they're paying the paying the schools and, and, and kicking back stuff to them and licensing so that they can be the online vendor. Um, talk about that later. Uh, yeah, that's what okay. we've noticed with BSN. Like BSN's another one that does that too. Like it's it's just like it's it's a BS deal. I mean, it's crazy. But like like it's it, they 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 their values and like kickbacks and stuff when it's like, okay. Like I don't know, but it, I think it's backwards for sure. Um yeah, but no, I, no, I don't no, know for it for us super backwards. I, it's it's hard because like with the enterprise we know for a fact what their volume is cuz in the past like um we've had like you know, for most of the customers going with enterprise, we're getting previous data. And so we know exactly like what that's going to ROI out at. So it's the monthly fee, like for that is mostly just like in producing goods. So, so I think um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and they were referring to Peter Thiel, who writes a really famous book um, called zero to one. And in zero to one, uh, Peter Thiel identifies like four types of moats, um, and a moat, think of like medieval times, but they say there's, you can create a moat by proprietary technology, network effects, economies of scale and branding, right? And what I'm hearing, Hunter, is when you get an enterprise client, right, you're almost trying to wrap your hands around them from every different angle, right? So like, we're going to build you the store, we're going to handle this, we're going to do that. And just kind of letting that incubate for long enough where like, they're surrounded by Maryland print house and you almost become like the de facto for them. Right. And I think that's something that print shops can look at and say is like, how do I create solutions for my clients to protect my business, but also like, so they just don't look anywhere else. And if I do that long enough, it's almost like guaranteed revenue every year. 
I don't know. Yeah, you just got to be willing to invest in that. Like, I mean, it takes like each of these accounts has three to five touch points like of people that they can reach out to at Maryland Print House uh, to cater to their needs. And like, you, you just have to be willing to like take a lesser paycheck and hire more people to like be able to, because like obviously like one person can't, you know, cater to, to every, you know, every need of this, this enterprise customer. So I think like, at, at least we've struggled trying to accomplish that. Um, because like everybody's hands are tied up and like, there's a lot of things to get done, um, during the day. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we, it, it, that I think just happens by chance. It's not that that's our, our main goal. Um, our main goal is just to meet, you know, or, or deliver above their expectation on what they either come to us for or what we've approached them about. But I think that just happens by nature for us and how we've done business for so long is like, we find it a lot easier for them and a lot easier for us if we're just doing it all for them on the apparel side. And even like we've segmented into vehicle wraps a little bit just because like it's easy. And like it, a lot of these same companies have a lot of vehicles. And so like, I think we just see opportunity like with like all of the different things that a company needs on the branding side. And like, we try to meet those expectations the best we can like as far as like delivery and, 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 you know, it's easy to go to somebody that has your, your files, your, lo your logo and file. It sounds simple, but like, that's a challenge for some companies, even at a large scale. It's like, okay, like we got to move all this. They, they think of it as a problem. And like the reality is it could be super simple, but that's just one simple thing that like translates to <laughs> a sale, you know? Are you, um, do you take a, a good salary home? Are you guys profitable with all this? We're profitable, yeah, but we still choose to not take a large salary because we invest so heavily back in. We're about to take uh, on another uh, 3,000 square feet next door. That, <laughs> it's like we're just constantly trying to, to grow. How do you think about that balance of how much am I reinvesting in versus when do I try to start dividending out? Because I, I had always found it, difficult as it's like you could sort of see the next step you could sort of see where to go to the next you know i could see the light at the end of the tunnel in a way but um does it ever come to a point where you think okay i, I actually want to pay myself really well now well so i have two partners as well um andrew and andrew uh but uh, <laughs> they uh one's one's it one's in production and then one's in sales and so um, they started because I didn't have the cash flow to just be able to pay people good, like good money. Um, so I brought them into Maryland Print House when we started. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely better than it was then uh, as far as paying ourselves out. But I, I, one of the things that we set is quarterly, you know, quarterly sit down of like, where are we at? Our goal is to be at 15% net. Like if we can get there, we're super good. Like that's best case. If we can, you know, we're, we're typically falling around seven to eight, but like, if we can, we're constantly focused on goals, like setting goals on profitability, because it's like super important. If we're going to do all this stuff, we need to make money. Um, but then setting up bonus, a bonus structure every quarter to just compensate for the no weekly or low weekly pay. Do you, do you take your, the three of your co-founder salaries and your profit and combine them? Or do you consider them two different things? No, they're all included in payroll. Like as far as like how, like it's part of our bottom line number. Yeah. We're like, cause the way that I'm starting to think about it is like, uh, there's a price to be the founder of the company and operate it. And you should have a really good paying salary for that. And the company should be profitable. I feel like shops early on combine the two a little bit. Like Bruce, do you see this happening where they like um, they'll say like payroll and profit are the same thing? But really, Hunter, you're you're a contributor to the company as a leader, right? Um, I don't know. I, I've been thinking about this quite a bit because what, what I was just gonna say, we learned that like a couple years ago, like when we sat down with we we now have like a CFO, like accounting team, like we pay, you know, that we sit down with all the time. But like they, you know, we were super quick to change that and look at it in a totally different light because M and A, like if we ever want to go for acquisition or or gets, you know, bought, like we need to we need to include that stuff, you know, and that needs to be a part of it. And so like we've we've definitely changed that. And like I feel like we should pay ourselves based on what that bottom line number looks like. And so we need that number in there. 
you know, before it was just draws and it didn't even, you know, hit the bottom line. So we did operate that way for a little bit. Yeah. How do you look at it now, Steven, or did it change? Well, we, we look at like, so, um, our company is scaling very quickly. So, you know, we'll go from six, 7 million to 12, 13 million in a year. And as the company is growing, we've taken on a lot of investments. We have a trajectory to burn money and then at a certain point become profitable, and you get profitable by selling more, making more on what, you, what you're what you selling or reducing your expenses. And we're almost like laser focused in now on getting to stable state where, you know, the business can be doing, we know what like our gravy numbers look like. We know what our burn numbers look like, but I am just a part of that machine. And, and, and like, it's almost like I'm an employee of Campus Inc. And profit is a different thing but it is more important that the company gets profitable um while while we're doing that so i've definitely over the last like year um really started to look at it because we can burn a, a shit ton of money overnight as we're growing really really fast now to like wait what about but also before the investment too like did you think about it sort of in the same way or was it um, different? i was probably co- i was process? more looking at profit and payroll as the same thing like what's my take home Right. Like um, whether I pay myself, you know, X and profit is Y, they're essentially the same. Now I look at it completely different Um, because to kind of Hunter's point, if we want the business to be positioned to thrive on its own, I'm just a part of that process. So like there's definitely a huge mental shift um, as you start to grow a little bit. I I feel like there's maybe a revenue number. If It's like after you get to four or five million dollars, you maybe start to think about it like that. I don't know. I don't know, Bruce, how did, how did you look at it, you know? Um... Traction, but it was the percentage of revenue is what owner's pay should be targeting. And it was something like like up to maybe $3 million or so, it was about 10% should be owner now owners i say that because you know if there's multiple partners they have to split that pool if it's one then that all goes to them and then it slowly scales down as the company grows larger so you know maybe if that's that 10 million it goes down to like call it three percent or five percent or whatever it is uh but that was how they were saying to bake it in but to be a a kind of we'll call it w2 type of salary that comes off now granted you can optimize for better taxes through distributions versus taking a just salary part. But yeah, that was interesting to have a standard for it. Right. Cause you're, you're right. Like for a long time, it is just sort of what's left over. And I think that's what you have to do at the beginning, but um, that's, yeah. I mean, dangerous. I think a lot of it too is just surviving. I mean, like for us, like when we started, it was like, what's your monthly costs? Everybody that's a part of this thing. Do you want to go to the moon or not? Like, let's make a decision here and we're going to pay based on what our overhead is. And then if you want, there'll be some fun money on top of that. And like, let's roll, you know, I think that's how we looked at it for a long time. And I mean, we still look at it that way. Um, I mean, like at the end of the day, like the money will come. I've always seen it that way. And like, if you're doing the right thing and you're, and you're doing what you need to do, like, I don't need to be making like 250,000 a year right now. Like I'm, pretty content making like 60, you know, like, because I don't need more. And if I can keep putting that, pushing that money to the bottom line and keep investing back in, like, I just know, like, there's a future there. I mean, especially when we're burning, like, you know, I, you know, with, with tech and, and all of that, like, you'd be burning 10,000 a month just on, you know, building, like, if not more than that. So like, this is just small things that we've done to like, try to build revenue because we can focus on that net profit number later um, as long as we can get we're, we're at that weird point you know where it's like in order to get even bigger than where we're at today and continue this 30 to 50 percent growth we've had year over year like how do we do that with the space that we have now and like like not have to do a million things, you know? And I think that's like where we, we found ourselves struggling. And like, I'm really hopeful like shirt desk can actually launch. We're supposed to launch in January, but like, I hope we can actually get that started because it's a big, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, we've been three years in this thing uh, come January of this year, up, upcoming year. But like, you know, um, 
that's just been a money pit it, as of today. It's a great, it's such a gray area, and I don't know the right answer. I I do know that it is addicting to to continue to reinvest, and I don't think that there's an end goal. And it makes me wonder if it's like what you're saying, a lifestyle thing. So it's a okay, I actually would like to take longer vacations or I have like a family to support or I have these other things that actually demand a a supportable salary or like I want to generate more savings for myself. And that's maybe the turning point versus where the business is at separately. So, I mean, I just keep seeing results. Like results is what's driven us. Like it's been result after result, like for the last six years. And I know there's going to be a point where that result's not going to be satisfactory to me. But like, I just feel like if you are seeing results, you should keep doing it, you know? I think I've learned some hard lessons of like, it's good to have a, a what bird in hand, like small wins early on in your career, where when you have small wins, then you can be lethal. Um, and so like, I, I was, I was, you know, talking to someone a little bit about like, um, getting a small win early in your career, banking up some money, putting away, you know, something, um, and then going back to the poker table versus like chasing this cause it's addicting Hunter, right? Like we see this chase and we see this climb and, uh, you can get sucked into it and you get sucked out of it. Like it could spit you out. Uh, it could, it could, you know, we've seen, we've seen businesses that people burn out trying to do this. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see these fast growth, younger companies and how you're thinking about it. But, um, I also think there's something to be said about like, what if you at five or $6 million, have you thought about like, let's just get super freaking profitable in the next 12 months. Let's make, let's make a million dollars in the next 12 months. And then we're going to be like super happy versus like continuing to grow, like growth at all costs versus like pulling the e-brake a little bit. Have you thought about that? No, I agree with you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, when we sat down in our last, um, you know, financial meeting was discussed about getting to this 15% net. I mean, 15% net for us is including paying ourselves would be very, very, you know, I'd be very stoked with that. Like, so I think like, I don't know. I, I think lifestyle is a good way to put it for sure, because like you're seeing results and you're consistently doing well, but it would be good to have, um, you know, some cash and, you know, your personal bank. I, I think, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's preference and I think it just depends on like what the goals are, you know, cause like for us, like we're looking at acquisition, like we're, we have two, two potential acquisitions that are hopeful to happen by the end of next year. And like, that's, that was one of our main focuses to, to get growth, um, not even on screen printers, but on potential contract customers and stuff that we do work for because they're super profitable and like, they're just selling direct to consumer. So I think like just, you know, building that nut like you can do that even reinvesting like a significant chunk you know i think and like how can you take that nut that you've built up and then buy something else or invest in space or equipment or whatever like you know what can you do to like grow even more and i think that's that's something we've always done and if you're not debt heavy what's the you know what's the real risk hunter how old are you yeah 27 yeah damn you've got some, you've got some hustle in you. Like it's pretty impressive what you've built, um, to be able to do that and, and bootstrap it in five, six years is awesome. Right. You guys too, for sure. It's crazy. Um, it's, it's cool to think if we were to look into a glass ball 10 years from now, like what are you going to be doing <laughs> or what's your business going to look like? You know, Bruce is still going to be trying to heat press. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it's super <laughs> I think fascinating. In 10 years we go back to every guest and do like a 10 year anniversary thing is like, Hey, this is what you said before. What do you think? And just to see what people say. Uh, this is cool. No, Hunter. I I think this is super, super interesting. And, and I think we, it's exciting to see what y'all are working on because I think we're working on some similar things. So this is, this will be fun to chat through in the future. Hunter, thanks for joining us. We'll see you on the next print hustlers podcast episode and at the conference. Um, would be amazing to see you this year. Go to printhustles.com and grab your tickets. All right.
have a good one. Thanks, Hunter. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully that was informative. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications if you enjoyed this video. If you enjoy all the stuff we're putting out, it's really helpful. We love to just be able to see it. That means that we're doing a good job. To subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and hit the like button. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.